Francesca. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hi. It's great to be here with you and uh, very pleased to be the final keynote for the day. Uh, okay, yes, I don't hear myself anymore. That's fantastic. So my uh, final keynote is going to be about how to build digital and green cities that are people first and that are based around data sovereignty, fundamental rights of people and direct technological advances, innovation and the digital opportunities to tackle the great challenges that we are living today, starting with the green transition and the climate crisis. Next slide. The crisis that we are experiencing today and we are living towards in multiple crises. We have, of course, still a health emergency ongoing. We have a climate emergency, but we also have a, the rising of inequalities and many other social and environmental issues to tackle. Some economists are talking about the first comprehensive economic crisis of the Anthropocene, and we are leaving a very deep link between the pandemic, the climate crisis, and the impoverishment of biodiversity. However, the crisis that we are experiencing creates a strong opportunity to articulate a new direction for our society and our economies. Because crisis, being them uh, pandemics or wars can sometimes fuel the social imagination of communities and societies. And today, more than ever, we need radical and forward looking ideas and projects with potential to transform our economies and our societies, projecting us into a digital democratic and carbon neutral future. So we should take this opportunity and Europe at the moment has the objective to become a leading, uh, a leading force towards sustainable and democratic digitization, bringing together the European Green Deal, which is our very big objective to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050 and the digital strategy of Europe, which is proposing a kind of new digital humanism. So technological progress, but putting people, communities and the environment first. So this moment, next slide, it is also a very important opportunity, the post pandemic phase, to rethink our cities. I think that cities, places, the place where we live, but also the built environment are the critical areas uh, where we can experiment new ways of living, new ways of working, and also a new relationship between nature, technology, creativity, and culture. And cities can really become laboratories for democratic and sustainable innovation. And of course, this is also because uh, local governments and local administration are closer to citizens and they can have the capacity, the agility and proximity to activate the transformations that we need quickly. And also because large cities have a special role in fighting against climate change or for the digital transition to, to widespread, let's say, the digital transition across society to include citizens, to make it inclusive and to make it work for the people. In many cases, we already consider many cities that are benchmarked in sustainable mobility or in the fight against climate change or even in digital uh, transition. And due to the proximity, cities can be seen as agents of social cohesion looking also at all the divides and inequalities. So making sure that innovation not only happens at speed, as we are experiencing during this pandemic, where we see a rapid, rapid uh, speed when it comes to digitization, 
But at the same time, we want to do it in a way that's inclusive and then doesn't create more inequalities, but that it helps us to reduce the inequalities that we have today when it comes to socioeconomic backgrounds, to gender divides, to territorial divides, to racial divides, and to all the different divides, also starting with the digital one that we have to bridge. Next slide. When we are talking about smart cities, so smart city, the intelligent cities of the future, has become a little bit of a buzzword about what we are going to experience in our digital society. Uh, but we have to consider smart cities not only starting from technology first, so thinking about technological cities that are built with sensors and connectivity with data, but without really having the big questions, smart for whom or cities for whom. Uh, the Financial Times last year wrote an article, you can see it on the slide, by the main commentator of the technology section, saying there are two models in the world to think about smart city. One is the technology first, corporation-led smart city. Here there is the example of Toronto, which is a Google, let's say a Google-led smart city. But this could work, but also it has a lot of problems because it's not really democratic, it's not accountable to citizens, and it is built top-down technology first, where data and connectivity are mainly controlled by a few big tech companies. But we also have another model for the smart city, which is the people first, human centric city, like the model of Barcelona. Of course, I was very pleased to see that Barcelona was represented a model for a digital city that put people first, because at that time I was the chief technology officer of the city of Barcelona. And this Barcelona model, it's built thinking about people and their daily life issues first. So thinking about what do we want to tackle as main environmental, social, and economic challenges, and only after we can think about how can technology, data, and connectivity help us if we put it at the service of people and if we govern them democratically, help us to achieve those goals. Next. So, the, yes, the Barcelona model is people first, next, not technology first. I think this is very important because I cannot stress it more. When I was called by the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, uh, I, I used to be in London before moving to Barcelona to run the smart city there. And one day, the newly elected mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, the first woman to become mayor of Barcelona, very socially minded and very close to the citizens, she asked me to go to Barcelona to become the digital chief. And she gave me one mission. She said, I want to be, I want you to explain the smart city to my mother. I want the technology to be really put at the service of citizens. They have, they have to understand the benefit. They have to see what this technology is bringing to them, what kind of problems technology is helping to solve in their daily life. So I had to, it seems like a very obvious thing, but actually I had to rethink the entire strategy. And instead of starting from blockchain, 5G, connectivity, uh, quantum computing and apps, I had to start from the real questions that the city was trying to solve. Reduce inequalities, affordable housing for all, healthcare, sustainable healthcare, sustainable mobility, the ecological transition, the creation of more green public spaces, and of course, reduction of carbon emissions. These were the things that people cared about, and we understood that we had to put technology at the service of tackling these real fundamental social and environmental challenges. Next. 
So we decided to do this by engaging citizens in a large scale participatory democracy movement. We use the hybrid model of online participation in neighborhoods, in the streets, in communities, but also of online participation using digital platforms. So we created a open source privacy announcing platform called Decidi in Barcelona. And we managed to engage over 400,000 citizens into shaping the agenda of the city of Barcelona. Over 70% of the proposals that became the action plan of the city government of Barcelona came directly from citizens. So they could use technology and could gather in communities to express their problems, to vote about their priorities, but also to deliberate and debate about issues that matter to them. So we were really rethinking about trust, trust between the public administration and the citizens, which is really essential to engage citizens and uh, integrate their collective intelligence into the decision-making of the city. And by engaging citizens, together with them trying to shape the future of the city using all tools available, also high-level technology tools. Next. There are things that cities are really well positioned to lead about, and one of that is the fight against climate change. Uh, there are many cities that have um, a big plans to become carbon neutral, by 2030, even the city of Helsinki, by to lower emissions like the climate uh, justice transition is saying in Europe by 60%, by 50, 55 or 60% by 2030. And to put forward uh, big plans to become um, carbon neutral because the future of the city is about creating more green and public space, reshape mobilities by using um, electric mobility, connected mobility, by you know, augmenting the space for, um, for pedestrians or for bicycle lanes, and try to really tackle CO2 emissions in all possible ways. And also cities are coming together in networks like the C40 network in order to, to achieve those ambitious climate actions and also to transition uh, from oil towards renewable energy. For instance, one of the big plans that we implemented in Barcelona was the creation of a new solar energy company. And this solar energy company involved also the uh, deployment of a decentralized electricity grid where also users and citizens could put their solar panels and could generate clean energy and then integrate this energy into the city grid in order to pr produce solar green renewable energy. All the public buildings now in Barcelona are powered by uh, green energy and in fact we have a pilot of 25,000 private homes which are participating in the production of solar energy. Next. Another big um, action plan, which is still also related to fight uh, climate change, so this is the big ecological transition, which I think is priority number one in cities, but also in general is about rethinking and replanning cities uh, to um, take away the cars from the city center and to create more green uh, spaces, but also, and we, here we're talking about a model like the 15 minute cities or the 30 minute cities, which means that citizens can get access to all the services and everything they need also to go to work and the services they need uh, within uh, 15 minutes. In Barcelona, we reshape the city centers by regaining 60% of public space that be before was devoted to cars. And so we removed the cars from the city centers and then together with 
um, architects, urban planners, and residents, we redefine the use of these new public spaces. And of course, you have now more green areas, you have new businesses, new local uh, businesses for residents, new cultural activities, and so on, by reconquering citizen space. Next. Of course, you, in order to become a digital city that put people first, you also have to rethink government in order to make it more open, more transparent, and more collaborative. So many cities are initiating programs for digital transformation, which are also about, you know, opening up government and being, um, let's say, more open and transparent on how data and information is used. Next. In order to do this in Barcelona, we created a set of ethical digital standards. We decided to use open source and free software for our um, solutions and our to develop our applications. So we shifted 80% of the IT budget to open source and free software. We also decided to use interoperable solutions and uh, we uh, introduced agile methodology, but in particular ethical data management, because we had this idea that we wanted to give back democratic control of technology and data to citizens. This is the idea of gaining technological and digital sovereignty. And in order to do that, we also had to change the rules of city procurement. I know that this word uh, doesn't sound very sexy, but this is what governments do in office. They use uh, public money, citizen money, in order to procure services and to, you know, deliver services to citizens, to buy technology and deliver services. So we decided to integrate these ethical digital standards into the clauses of the contracts. For instance, we introduce data sovereignty clauses. What this clause is said is that any um, provider that would win a public bid in the city of Barcelona had to give back the data to the city hall in machine readable format. This data was then considered in the public domain, like a public good, a public infrastructure that could be opened up and used by citizens, by innovators, by startups, by journalists, by cooperatives, by uh, anybody in order to create new services. And at the same time, we um, put, uh, we mandated the use of ethics, security and privacy by design. So we could share the data and use it for the public good, but at the same time, protecting citizen rights. Next. Yes, the smart city, it is about producing data and we need a new social pact, which is uh, to regain data sovereignty for citizens. Next. Data is the raw material of the digital economy. Uh, data is the most valuable economy in the world today and companies in every industries are counting on artificial intelligence to drive growth over the next years. Machine learning will increase return on investment by 10 to 30% in the next years. So even Angela Merkel last year said in Davos that who own the data will decide at the end whether a democracy, a participatory social model and economic prosperity can be combined. So who owns the data can set the rules of the future economy. Next. Unfortunately, today, we live in a digital economy that looks a little bit like this. Many economists talk about data extractivism. So data and, of course, artificial intelligence are in the hands of very few companies, five to seven big tech companies. Of course, the GAFAM, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon and Apple, but also the Chinese equivalent, Tencent, Baidu, Huawei, which are growing as tech giants. And the metaphor is data gets extracted like oil and can only be refined by the artificial intelligence systems, which are owned by a handful of big tech companies. Next. 
Harvard Business School uh, economist um, Shoshana Zuboff wrote a great book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And she defines surveillance capitalism as a new phase in economic history in which private companies and governments track your every move with the goal of predicting and controlling your behavior. Under surveillance capitalism, you are not the customer or even the product, you are the raw material. So this is not a very good situation in which we are consuming and producing data, but we are the raw material that get extracted by a few oligopolies of big tech companies. So how can we, we move from a data extractivism and surveillance capitalism to a system where data can become a public good and put at the service of society to help us to tackle the big challenges of our time? Next. Also, when we think about uh, data and the, and the digital economy, we don't want to end up in a black box society. There is a need for strong public engagement, and we have to consider the social, ethical, racial, and geopolitical implications of artificial intelligence and automated decision systems, because we don't want to end up with facial recognition systems that are having biases and discrimination with racial profiling, but also with exploiting uh, renewable materials, workers' exploitation, and many other things that come with an uncontrolled and unregulated use of technology. So many experts are telling governments that we want to end black boxes algorithm in governments. We want to have ethical, accountable, transparent, and secure artificial intelligence and automated decision-making systems. Next. Also, if we do not control artificial intelligence and data, we, we are not able to control and regulate the business model of the sharing economy platforms. Of course, there are benefits about innovation and creating more startups and creating new businesses. We also want to grow these businesses in Europe and making sure that we can lead the way when it comes to innovation in the next uh, generation platforms. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the business model of those companies doesn't impact the welfare state, for instance, in Europe, the ability of people to pay for their rent and to have affordable housing, public transportation systems and so on. So we need to make sure that the benefits of innovation uh, are, are, are um, basically in place. We have check and balances so that we can maximize the benefits and we can reduce the risk of these business models. And as you know, Airbnb, for instance, in the last years, represented a big problem for cities because the price of rent went up dramatically two or three times in, in particular in uh, touristic cities like Berlin, like Barcelona, uh, like Brussels or like Amsterdam. And city came together and they said, well, if we do not have access to the data, we cannot regulate these platforms. We cannot say, for example, you can rent on short-term rentals for these numbers of days. Uh, maybe we have to, you can rent in some areas, but you cannot do it in other areas. And also we have to make sure that these companies, of course, pay taxes. So in order to regulate in the best possible ways, those platforms, we need to make sure that there is access to the data and the algorithms are transparent and accountable and that they can be negotiated because also for example when it comes to uh, ride sharing the riders uh, food delivery platforms or uber drivers and so on there is a very strong impact of those algorithms on labor standards and so we want to make sure that workers are not discriminated by the use of artificial intelligence and algorithms next there is also lots of benefits in uh, using open data, for example, an open budget to do anti-corruption policies. Many cities are publishing their information and data in open portals. So as citizens, you can check what's happening. You can also check what policies are put in place. You can use the data to monitor, for instance, the flow of public transformation and, and public transportation, and you can use a lot of applications that are useful for you to live your life and to navigate the city. 
But you can also see how budget is allocated, which is a very important part of how the city are run and which policies and which projects the budgets are allocated to if you use open data. And also in Barcelona, we did something very pioneering, which was putting an, a whistleblower platform online, which was called Bustia Etica, so that everybody, city officials, but also citizens, preserving their privacy, they could um, denounce any cases of corruption so that the government stay clean. Next. When it comes to the smart city, it is very important to realize that today we have large scale infrastructure such as the fiber network. Uh, for instance, Barcelona had, has uh, 20 kilometers of fiber network. And on top of that, we have a sensor network. The sensors allow the cities to measure energy monitoring, noise monitoring, to make sure that garbage collection is done properly, uh, to monitor parking spots and uh, make sure that you you can have an app where the allocation of your of parking is uh, clear to citizens so you don't need to drive around in search for a parking slot. Uh, you can monitor water on distance and all this data gets aggregated in um, data lakes which are owned by the city and you have a standardized ontology that allows you to describe the data and then to use this data in order to feed uh, artificial intelligence systems and to create predictive modeling so to use this data to take better decisions data-driven decisions next at the same time, all this data that get, gets aggregated in the city operating system uh, can present risk when it comes to privacy, ethics, and security of citizens. So in Barcelona, we did a very interesting experiment with the Decode project, and we were betting in a future model where the data is not controlled by this handful of uh, four to five big tech companies, but also is not controlled by the big state. But we gave back the control of data to citizens so that citizens can decide what data they wanna keep private and use strong encryption to do that. So encryption as a human right. So if you use strong encryption, you can control what happens to your data. Then share data and share data on their terms. So you know what information is shared and who can get access to this information and on what terms. In order to do this, which is basically a new social pact on data, allocating new rights to citizens to control their data, we use a decentralized privacy enhancing infrastructure based on the blockchain. And, uh, and uh, we developed a cryptographic protocol that enable citizens to basically control and share their data on fair and accountable terms. Next. We also integrated this blockchain infrastructure into the participation platform, the CD in Barcelona, a digital participatory platform. Because in fact, what we're doing with data is really to enable local community engagement. So enable citizens to uh, measure data, to collect information, to do environmental data sharing so that citizens are participating in solving the city problems, but they're also part of finding new solutions to the climate crisis, for instance. This is an experiment run in the neighborhood of Barcelona, where citizens were putting sensors in their home in order to measure pollution and noise. And then this um, measurement that came from the citizen sensors was integrated into the Internet of Things platform of the city. And then the information was coming to the city hall in a privacy preserving way. So at the same time, maintaining the privacy of people. And then the city was able with this information to act upon the problems that were uh, signaled by the citizen themselves. So this is about a real kind of participatory process, which is fostered by a different usage of data. Next. So this is the model of the city of Barcelona, let's say a data democracy, putting people and their fundamental rights first and giving back democratic control of data to citizens, creating a real data commons 
and uh, using blockchain and decentralized technology in order to do that. And then opening up the data to innovators, to startups, to cooperatives, to data journalists, and use this data to create public value, to create new services, and to help transform the city for the better. Next. We also have very exciting projects at the European level that are looking also to regain more data sovereignty for Europe. For instance, the big Gaia X program. So what Europe wants to do with Gaia X is uh, to do a coordinated, uh, um, let's say, digital industrial strategy of Europe because uh, today artificial intelligence, cloud computing, uh, quantum, which is the next frontier of innovation, and data are the critical infrastructures of our times. And so we need to understand as a continent, as Europe, how we can um, invest more in these infrastructures, create talent in the universities, in the research centers, and also create new companies, new startups, grow companies that can use this data to innovate different, um, different sectors. And Gaia-X is a very ambitious program for Europe that wants to create a gold standard for data security and interoperability. And this is also because Europe, as you know, has one of the most advanced, maybe the most advanced legislation in the world about data protection and data sovereignty, which is the uh, GDPR, the General Directive for Data Protection. And we are setting e-privacy standards globally. And I think this is very important because in this way, we can keep sharing data and create value for everybody, but at the same time, protecting our fundamental rights, our right to privacy, to information self-determination, and our data protection. Next. So how we can use all these technologies and the new policies in order to develop a innovation ecosystem and, and, and foster a new type of economies towards a circular economy. Next. As I also said before, we're going to see all this infrastructure, for instance, the 5G city. Now 5G is being deployed in many cities around the world, and this new connectivity will bring to all different type of application, connected vehicles, connected mobility, uh, distant medicine, uh, more distant education, uh, lots of innovation even in agriculture, in space technology, and so on. So we will have to, in the city, we can uh, deploy this technology like in a laboratory and then find the best use cases and involve the city innovation ecosystem, starting from startups, from corporates, but also citizens themselves, in order to see what are the problems that we can tackle with this technology. Next. For instance, one uh, area where I think we will see a lot of innovation in the future is mobility. How uh, we are gonna you know, move from a city where now we have, of course, lots of the public space, which is occupied by cars, towards um, a city with lots more of public and green spaces, spaces for people, uh, space for pedestrians, integrated public transportation system with metro, buses, uh, tubes, and, um, and, and then private transportation, which is shifting towards electric mobility, connected mobility, and sharing mobility. Uh, if to find out what are the ways in which this new type of mobility will develop in cities, many cities are creating uh, future mobility hubs. For instance, there is one in Europe, which has 46 cities involved, 15 countries, 17 companies, 18 research centers, which are collaborating in order to find out what are the next mobility trend. And it will, it's going to be very exciting to see how is this going to play out in cities, because of course, if you change mobility, you can also tackle CO2 emission and you can improve the quality of life of citizens in a very considerable way. Next. It's very exciting to see also how cities are becoming a science hubs, laboratories for this new type of infrastructures. This is the Barcelona supercomputing centers, but more and more the technological facilities 
uh, like infrastructure like this, supercomputing or cloud computing, uh, startup hubs are not anymore far away from the city centers, but are straight in the core of the city. And so uh, the cities are also a place where collaboration between science, technology, creativity, and the arts can happen. Next. Because of course, we, have, we want to use all this potential and all this technological infrastructure and the scientific capacity in order to foster creativity, culture, and innovation. And uh, this is, for example, a former factory, a textile factory, which today in Barcelona is being repurposed as a factory of creativity, of creation, where you have artists of all kind coming together to work in an interdisciplinary way. And that's what I was saying at the beginning, that if you couple the infrastructure capacity of cities with the science hubs, with this kind of creative factories for imagining new type of innovation at the intersection of arts, science, technology, and creativity, you can really develop new, uh, new products and new services, but also new spaces for living, new lifestyle and the real transformation of spaces and communities. Next. This is an example of how this um, interplay between science, technology and the arts for the Green Deal, for the ecological transformation can work. So this is the STARTS network, which is fostered by the European Commission. The European Commission has been running this STARTS program since uh, uh, five years now, and they have created regional hubs where scientists, uh, technologists and artists come together in residencies. Uh, they prototype new flagship projects, which are bringing together technology, science and arts. And also every year they give a start prize to, in, to the innovation that embeds this kind of creativity using maybe advanced technology or advanced infrastructure, but pushing the boundary of what science and technology can do in an artistic way, in a creative way, because artists are the critical antenna of our societies and they can also direct, I mean, express and find out new path for innovation to happen and to develop is a new type of technology transfer that can really lead to innovating at large scale and also can lead to find new materials to experiment with artificial intelligence and music with quantum and music or with new type of creative expression starting from the scientific and technological advancements next yeah this is an example for example for uh, a start prize that won in uh, 2020 and uh, it was a project developed in Barcelona where um, large scale data visualization about urban uh, planning were used in order to reshape the use of the city center in Barcelona, La Rambla. And this was a um, interdisciplinary work done by data scientists and architects and the planners of the city that by using this kind of technique and creative way to uh, visualize the city and engage with citizens in a large scale participation ended up doing a very innovative uh, master planning to, to reshape the city center of Barcelona, and also to find the right balance between economic activities, leisure, tourism, and the public space. Next. This is a very exciting project, which I think it's bringing together everything I've been talking about until now. Uh, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in the State of the Union, after she presented the European Green Deal, which is our ambitious strategy to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050 and lower dramatically CO2 emission in order to 
achieve the ecological transition, which is the main objective of Europe at the moment, she decided to couple the Green Deal with a cultural, artistic and educational movement, which is the new European Bauhaus getting some inspiration from the historical Bauhaus that created a profound transformation, bringing together design and the very same idea of sustainability, laying out the foundation for modern architecture and rethinking the built environment. So we are at a moment where we have to rethink our cities, we have to decarbonize the economy. We have to reshape the built environment, shifting from concrete to eco-based materials, working much more with wood and lowering CO2 emissions. Uh, we need to um, you know, move to a circular economy and, uh, and enable this uh, circle of um, recycling, shifting to renewable energy. We have a real paradigm shift that we have to do in order to achieve and deliver on the Green Deal. And of course, the work, we can only do that in an interdisciplinary way, bringing together the capacity of planners, of architects, of designers, of creative minds, of artists, of uh, performance artists, of all possible really creative people together with this, the top uh, high level scientific and technical expertise that we have in Europe. And then from the bottom up, create a real movement starting from cities and citizens and communities in order to give, um, to open up spaces for these laboratories of uh, creativity, which are going to be the new, new European Bauhaus laboratories throughout Europe in order to prototype this kind of sustainable, inclusive and beautiful spaces of the future. Next. Of course, we can achieve all this vision and we can uh, deliver uh, these kind of programs and projects in cities and ever, everywhere in Europe, if we work on capacity building, education and empowerment. Of course, investing in human talent at the end is the most important thing and creating capacity also means to really invest in education, digital skills and workers capacity. Next. At the same time, if we want to really do this ecological and digital transition in an inclusive way, uh, also respecting kind of social cohesion and lowering the inequalities, we have to start by empowering uh, women in tech. We, we want to also get rid of the gender gap, which is really big when it comes to the digital. I always say that we cannot have a digital revolution if it's not also a democratic and feminist revolution. And this is really at the core of, we want to, of what we need to do. And if we look at the gender gap, I mean, it continues to widen. Uh, women are still very much underrepresenting in, sci in sci scientific education, in ICT jobs, in the tech and academic careers is lower than 30% across Europe and it gets lower than 20% in some countries in Europe. So we have a lot to do to empower women in the tech industry and to make sure that women talent is really at the center of this digital transition. Next. The beautiful thing about cities is that cities act in networks. So it's not only the city of Barcelona that is doing all these incredible projects, but there, are, there is a, a big network of cities that are experimenting with this kind of democratic and ecological transformation. For instance, we have the City Alliance on Digital Rights, where we have around 100 cities that came together under the banner of the UN Habitat, the United Nations body that works with cities, in order to state their principle of protecting people and their digital rights in the digital age. So universal e and equal access to the internet, digital literacy, privacy, data protection and security, transparency, accountability, non-discriminatory use of data, content and algorithms, participatory democracy, 
diversity and inclusion and open and ethical digital service standards. Those are some of the principles where uh, many cities are coming together in a shared program in order to deliver, I think, a new type of digital humanism that put people first and that protects our data, the environment and our workers' rights. Next. I think even now in this pandemic, but also even more looking at the post pandemic phase, we have a great opportunity to shape a green and digital new deal that will start from the bottom up, from the ground up in cities and with citizens at the very core. It is a new kind of digital humanism that is about using digital technologies to attain both social and environmental sustainability. And I think this is the European type of innovation that we could offer to the world. And I think that cities are a great place to start experimenting in shaping this kind of more sustainable, inclusive and democratic future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca, actually, just sitting here listening to everything that you're saying. And I have so many questions, but we have audience questions as well. So I'm going to get to those first, actually, if you're, you're ready. Mm -hmm. Our first question is asking about the new European Bauhaus and if that is a closed think tank or an open platform that anyone can join. Yes, thank you. No, this is super open. So actually, uh, the intention uh, coming from the president of the European Commission is really to create a bottom up participatory movement. And uh, at the moment, we are in the co-design phase. Uh, I'm part of the high level roundtable of the new European Bauhaus advising President von der Leyen. Uh, but in the co-design process, there is a participatory phase at the moment, which is going on and you can submit your proposals and your ideas about the new European Bauhaus in the website. You can easily find it on the, on the European Commission website. And by the end of May, you can apply to the Euro new European Bauhaus price. There are many categories uh, of the things I also talked about. And uh, there is also a category for under 35, um, for, for under 35 artists. So to give a possibility also to emerging uh, creat creatives and artists to propose their ideas. Um, kind of taking off from this idea when you're mentioning the new European Bauhaus and, and the new Green Deal. And when I think about this era even of Bauhaus and the idea of even Gassam's Kunstwerk and stuff, and you're kind of actually talking about bringing all these different places and in, in groups together to make them work. It is such an ambitious idea. And in some ways, when we talk about digital humanism and even circular economy, it's it's so separate from the idea that I think of now with capitalism, this top down, like capitalism, it, it can't work with equality. How is it actually, if you're trying to bring in some ways a Gesamtskunstwerk to the way that we operate cities and connectivity, how do you find it is actually getting different people in different groups together to actually see this common goal? Like, especially when there is this time pressure, not time pressure, but you're saying, you know, emissions rates by this, 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 this. It is such an amazing and amb ambition. Like, I'm like, yes, this is the world. This is the Europe we want. How, how is it actually on the ground working with all these different sectors and people? Well, first of all, I think we have to say that this can only happen from the ground up. That's what uh, I think it's very clear from representation. So for instance, the European Green Deal, it is a very ambitious policy with the right targets and the right objectives. We have EU recovery plans, the next generation EU at the moment, with very ambitious recovery plans from all the 27 different member states. But these cannot become reality from top down. No. They should not be seen as technocratic government programs implemented in Brussels or implemented top down by governments. They should be seen as bottom up objectives and missions implemented by communities, by people, by businesses from the ground up. And that's, I think, what we need to do now. And we have an urgency because the multiple crisis we are living 
it is urgent to change it is origin to shift and i think they these changes are some kind of civiliza civilization shifts that we need to make so i think we really have to take this moment serious i think we have a great opportunity in the post pandemic phase to show that the seeds for a more sustainable democratic and inclusive future are there that we can make these uh, projects real and i think i really think that the only way to do it is interdisciplinary innovation diversity bringing people i mean the, the world is very complex you know even if you look at the climate climate crisis if you look at how do we make sure that the digital revolution or transition is not going to be you know this kind of surveillance capitalism dominated by few companies and us working for these platforms in the gig economy without any rights this is not the future that we want so we need to shape this digital and game future and we can only do it through interdisciplinary creative collaboration bringing back in culture creativity and the arts together with science and technology with with long-term and ambitious policy goals. I think this is how we should do it. And the new European Bauhaus can become this kind of, um, let's say also um, reference point where Europe can become a model for the entire world on how to do it. Because you also have to stimulate social imagination. We need projects that are beautiful, that uh, you know, that can talk to people and that can address the sustainability challenge in a very concrete way. But just let me finish by saying they do not want to be elitist project. I think the first question was very important. They don't want to be perceived as some kind of um, you know, elitist project for people that can afford it. They have to be really also community projects. Uh, that's why I was mentioning a lot the question of affordable housing, the question of sustainable mobility, of going also in neighborhoods and in places in Europe, not only in the big cities, maybe also smart, smart countryside, not only smart cities, because we do not want to leave people behind. This has to be about people and also their most fundamental needs. That's the, the digital humanism. It's actually, I'm so happy to hear you speak today because it, it, it is, it, it brings not only that urgency, and like you said, if, if this is put together and you're stimulating the public imagination, then it's easier to, to show people the world that you are trying to build with them. It, then it's not this far off distant thing that some people don't have access to that, yeah, that it, it changes, obviously scary to a lot of people, but like you said, we're in this time right now where we've had so much shift that I guess everybody's sort of ready, maybe, hopefully. And if they're not, it's coming, right? <laughs> I have another question. Um, this question saying that you talked about building trust between public administration and citizens. And to, today, people have already expressed concerns about biases and data collection. What are your methods for finding out more about citizens' needs? And can you give us some examples of how you try to engage citizens in the shaping of Barcelona? What kind of individual agency do you enable and encourage? I get that without having people think, oh my god, this is the digital era. Like, who's watching? What are, what, who's owning me, basically? Yes. I think this is absolutely critical. Uh, there are two uh, things. Uh, the first one is um, not to present technology as a technological problem. Uh, we need to shift away from technological solutionism. We need to stop thinking that with an app, you're going to solve the world's problems. I mean, this is not true. <laughs> you're yeah. not solving uh, real complex problems of society, climate change, affordable housing, poverty, and so on with an app. Actually, if you start with technology, you are going to end up solving technology problems and forgetting about what are the real problems yeah. you want to solve. So you end up in this technological solutionism. Oh, okay, what do we need? Let's just build an app. <laughs> and then actually you end up with problems <laughs> related to, uh, yes, biases, um, uh, the lack of privacy, uh, non-sustainable business model, invasive, you know, uh, of everything, data leaks, all kinds of problems, non-interoperable solutions, everything. So I think um, we need to get away from this mindset and start thinking the, peop the people first, and then how can technology 
simplified and, and governed in the right way help us to achieve those goals. And so we don't need to go to the citizen and talk about blockchain and privacy and this and that. We need to tell them, what do you want to change in, in your neighborhood? I mean, this is what we have been doing with engaging people in Barcelona. And we started from what they cared about. And it was really ah, the air, we want to improve, we want to clean the air because this is unsustainable. We, ne we need to get rid of pollution. We need to get rid of traffic. We want a better um, waste management system. We want a better mobility system. We want to participate more because we want to hear, we want to have our voices heard in the city hall. These were the type of things, or we want better cultural services locally. We want better access to cultural activity and so on. And of course, better salaries and better living condition and working condition. But I mean, these are the things that people care about and you need to show that these things are very related to technology. Because in fact, uh, these platforms providing, for example, food delivery now and uh, the Airbnb and Uber and Google and so on, they're gonna change our life. So these, these, these uh, businesses are really proposing actually a vision for our future. And I think we have to be very careful here because we don't want to accept everything in this kind of, okay, everything that is future, it's going to be good. So you're going to end up in a world where you, everybody's going to drive in an Uber. We are all going to drink uh, Tesla coffees <laughs> and have emails <laughs> and everything provided by Google. I mean, this is not going to happen. So we need to shape technology in order to reach the type of future that we want, right? yes? And I think this is a, is a very important mindset shift. And then how you engage citizens, if you start talking about those kind of things, uh, you will realize that citizens are very willing to participate because they understand it's really about them, their life and shaping the, the future of their communities. And um, in our experiment in Barcelona, we could see that there weren't only young digital native people that were participating, but actually in many participatory processes, we had people also over 60 years old that were, they just cared about the issues, so they participated. So I think we need to shape those kind of participatory processes. And then the question of trust is very central to this because if they do not trust public institution, if they don't think that through engaging and participating, they can change things and they can really shape it, they are not going to engage. They are not going to also share their data. They're not going to take, be part of those processes. So I think trust uh, and reshaping the relationship between the public and people is very, very important. I, you just actually blew my mind. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I was, because this idea <laughs> of also like, yeah, coming back to digital humanism, of course, if you want to actually give agency to individuals, you don't talk to them about technology and all of this stuff. You don't talk to them. You say, what is it you need? And you approach them with a humanistic idea and approach, and then you can figure out how technology can actually aid in those things. And it seems so obvious. You obviously know this is why you said it, but I'm really like, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I could hear you talk more, but that's actually all the time that we have right now. I cannot thank you enough, really, for being with us, for sharing your insights, for answering questions. It's been absolutely wonderful. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to spend this uh, hour with you. And uh, it's a great event. So yeah. we need this kind of thinking in this moment and coming together. I mean, even if remotely, it has been a pleasure. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very, very much. Teresa. That uh, concludes day one of Creative Days Vienna. It's not over completely, just day one, so you gotta come back tomorrow. Um, like I said, that's no me at, at all, not the end of our experiences, our program. More is coming tomorrow, another day of thinking future, another day of hearing people say things that make your brain go and make all the connections that we're here to make. So I'm excited. And in the meantime, before tomorrow, if you actually happen to physically be in Vienna right now and you wanna check out one of our only live 
live experiences, non-virtual, then you can head over to Heldenplatz and check out the immersive installation Sonic Traces. It's by Thomas Eichinger and Peter Kohlreid. And Sonic Traces is an exploration. It's experienced via narrative moments and an atmospheric presentation of history. By making use of our AR technology, Sonic Traces creates an auditory trip for the senses through space and time. And since traveling right now is a difficult thing, and if you're in Vienna and you kind of feel like traveling through your senses, but you can't go somewhere else, go to Heldenplatz, check it out. And if you don't go, then we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you to our participants. Thank you for our viewers. Have a good evening.